I'm Amy, sex educator, somatic sex and relationship coach, and sex shop owner. And I'm April, VP of an international high-end pleasure products company and boss queen sex toy mogul. We're best friends who make our own rules about who we are as sexual beings. With everything from how to be a badass in the bedroom to top tips for bringing your relationship to the next level, we have something just for you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com. You are listening to a pleasure podcast. For more from our sex podcast collective, visit pleasurepodcasts.com. Hello, everyone. Hi, everybody. <laughs> that was my shout out to Cardi B. Oh, I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah, that's like her thing. I think it's funny. She just says, you can do it too. Good job. Oh, yeah. I know how to roll my tongue. Yeah, you do. I never use that in the bedroom. Do you though. have a fantasy about rolling tongues? somewhere that rolling tongues is well okay let me re- let me correct myself <laughs> you know when you can make a w with your tongue or you can make like a taco yeah can you do either of those things no and i've never thought that was hot <laughs> that's, my par- that's my party trick amy is it do it now <laughs> that's what i can't do the w i can know it's a recessive gene trait i like i, I like that i like that i like purring Brr. So this episode, everyone, is not about purring. It is about sexual fantasy. Yeah, we're just going to purr for 35 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> the science behind sexual fantasy. We'll read the bio for the guests shortly. Uh, but it's very informative. I loved it. Uh, we actually... We had a lot of fun. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. It was super... We're, we're in Salt Lake City in a hotel room. And so we have our computer out. And we're sitting next to each other sharing a mic. And uh, he he's an awesome, educated... Human, he's a, he's a researcher, researcher. But we were like, so here's my fantasy. What yeah. does it mean? What do you think about this? <laughs> it's it's not us just dissecting our fantasies with him. That nope. it actually gives you a ton of awesome information. He is super knowledgeable. I think that no matter who you are out there listening, yeah, oh, this is gonna apply to you. It is yeah. gonna apply to you. There's nothing specific to any um, person out there that if you. Well, if you've never had a fantasy, maybe now's your time. I don't know if it's possible. That's, I guess that's a good question. Like, are there any folks who, well, yeah. I don't know, maybe asexual folks don't have a lot of fantasy, but that's not true because it, there's a diversity of, in terms of the experience right. for asexuality. So I can't, I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for everyone, but I'm sure most people have had some sort of sexual fantasy and thus they don't feel, you know, arousal and desire Then I guess not. But yeah, we can't categorize everyone, but no. I seriously do believe that, um, any person that is a listener of our podcast will benefit from listening to this episode. It was fascinating. You talked about the top types of fantasies, like the top categories, where they may stem from, how we can talk to partners about them, how we can even act them out. If you want to act them out, if and you he, don't, then that's all good. He did research for years with thousands of Four, people. 4,000, I think, yeah. right? Is that what he said? So anyways, stay tuned. So, we'll tell you a little more about him in a moment. Um, on our last episode, we talked about Instagram a little bit, that we got shadow banned. And it's so confusing because they do not tell us what's going on. But long story short, uh, we were able to post yesterday and now we can't again. It's very confusing. Um, so this is the issue. They're, apparently, it seems like they're targeting a lot of female sex educators. I don't know. Maybe that's just my bias in a story that I, along with all the people that have been targeted that are all women, have made up. But that's what it feels like. Can I throw out there, if there yeah. is anyone out there listening to this podcast that maybe works at Instagram or <laughs> yeah. is an Instagram, no. some sort of Instagram affiliation, you have a your mom, your sister works there, can you email us and just like start a, uh, I just want some some dialogue to see if there if we can get light on this, but I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I think that is great to put out there because I would love to know. I just want just something and we won't even share it, you know, with the, the public unless you say it's okay. And yeah, we're in the, we're in the dark, but again, we've been censored and we can't do regular posts. And some of you who aren't on social networking sites, you're like, why the fuck does that matter? But it does matter partially because there's a lot that we do that is uh, inspiring people to live uh, more, more self, with more self love, to live with more self acceptance. Uh, and we love being a part of that there. It's just an easy medium to do that. So what we had to do, we still have our Shameless Sex Podcast Instagram. If you have not followed us there, go ahead. Please go to Shameless Sex Podcast on Instagram and follow us. Um, we also created a second one that's called Shameless X Podcast. 
please follow us on both. If you're already following Shameless Sex Podcast, please look up Shameless X Podcast on Instagram. Follow that as well. If you're not following either, please follow both of them. Um, our intention is to build up a second one as a backup in case we completely lose the first one because we want to stay in touch in this avenue and not let the patriarchy win. <laughs> and they really do just, they'll shut us down for no reason. We've been researching and reading. And Instagram, honestly, it's not for us. It's just a tool to give us a voice outside of the podcast. Obviously, it's not free speech. We know that we have to adhere to the uh, Instagram guidelines, uh, but they are a bit ambiguous when it comes to sexual content, even though our content of our Instagram is sexual in nature. It's, it's not explicit yeah. in a way that's harmful or violent or no. demeaning to any or sort of... Or it's, objectifying. It's, yeah. it's not really anything that I feel is offensive. However... It's it just an example of how we're still stuck in this like oppressive, repressive, those words confuse me, but I know that I know what they mean, that this, I mean, we're stuck in the same mentality, the same, the same thing that yeah. doesn't, doesn't, that is still teaching abstinence only sex education and is they're getting grants in places where they're, they're agreeing to not teach compliments my sex ish, education. My, just my issue with us being censored specifically is that you can search for a lot of these, um, these like they're, they're actually quite big and I don't even have an example for you, but there's this, there's this one specific that's like this guy pouring champagne over a bunch of naked chicks or half naked. Maybe now their nipples are censored, but um, like just accounts that are totally objectifying. I have one humans right here that you're talking about. Yeah. They have 410 K followers. They're na- there's just booties. And their name go. here is I'm a man. Get the fuck out my DM bra. Uh, <laughs> adult content, 18 plus big booty gallery. And it's just asses. Oh, it's well, there all, you go. it's See, just all and asses. That, that to me isn't very it's educational. Objectifying. It's objectifying. You're, you're objectifying bodies and turning them into body parts and specifically right. women's bodies, which Whatever. I mean, you're going to objectify. I don't really agree with you, but I'm not here to tell but you. But why is this person you you able to continue to post when yeah. I don't feel like we've posted anything that's out of the complete uh, realm of of support in in all forms of humans? How they how they come? So I don't know. Bottom line: follow us at Shameless X now because yeah, so Shameless X podcast just with a big Shameless X. X podcast and also if you're not already following shameless sex podcast follow both thank you we love you and if soapbox we're done we're done off the soapbox soapbox. here we go envision me not on my soapbox that's where i am now um we are also teaching if you are in the bay area or monterey bay area or anywhere in california that is near santa cruz or maybe you're really far away and you want to fly in just for this april and i are teaching on tuesday march 26 at pure pleasure this is 2019 we're teaching our erotic superstar how to step into your ultimate erotic power workshop this is open to all genders orientations all folks uh, come play with us come learn we are actually teaching this workshop uh, tomorrow night, which to you all is like last week, if you're listening yeah. to this, in Salt Lake City. But we're super it's sold excited. Out. It's I mean, sold it's, out. It's almost, yeah. I think they had a couple spots left, but it's sold out. And I think yeah. when uh, we talk with Peer Pleasure, I think that one's almost sold out too. It's very affordable. So check it out. I think you can get a ticket at purepleasureshop.com. Uh-huh. You can try to walk in, but it very well uh, may not have any more spots. So do pre-buy. We do suggest that. Come, because that means you get to hang out with us. Yeah, we have fun. Because knowledge is power. Yeah. Um, speaking of knowledge, Chip, what you know about Uber Lube? I know that you love well, Uber Lube. I know you know a lot about Uber Lube. It's funny because the other night I was uh, in um, the midst of, you know, an experience with my partner. You know. And, <laughs> you know, the uh, the <laughs> old one, two, one, two. Yeah. But we were going in anal, the anal, the, the back anal. door, <laughs> the, the old anal. And uh, I, c- I c- because I just moved all my things aren't in. Couldn't find your Uber loop. The different, they're not in this the spots where they belong. So I couldn't find the Uber loop. So I um, had a brand new one that like I hadn't opened yet, and so I ran and got that. And then I couldn't get the the plastic. The you know, there's a little tiny because oh, um, you were in a seal. rush and you're like, Dah. yeah. And then I was pumping and it wouldn't pump fast enough. And it was funny because I was like, pumping, 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 <laughs> and nothing came out. I was like, oh man. And so anyway, it was hilarious. I ended up. Um, 
using like my body oil because I was desperate. And then the next day I you pumped it didn't get one it open, time and, and it, it came, came out. out. And yeah. I was like, oh, that's so funny. So, that so was- there was no damage <laughs> to it. I was just over excited. And honestly, it probably did come out the night before. I just didn't even know because I was like, ah. well, they, so they do this thing on the bottle, by the way, that's called, it's like a safety mechanism. So that <laughs> <laughs> if you're overexcited. Yeah. So to make it so people like April don't just squirt herself in the eye. Dude, it was really funny. So my you, partner was dying. You automatically, I think they call it priming, where you have to pump it a number of times yeah. to get it going. And then once you get it going, then from there on, that's just the initial like start of it. And then after that, it's just one pump, you're ready to go. But okay, that's fun. I probably got it right to the max. Of, I primed it up. Just like I was primed up. <laughs> you were super primed. Uh, but I just wanted to come back to the fact that Uber Lube is my favorite. And uh-huh. not because I've known the brand for a while. It's it's actually made in the USA. It's a beautiful container. Like I really am into, bottle. you know, my I, I love ambiance. When, yeah. If it's overhead lighting, I'm like, no. I like creating <laughs> an environment, a space. And I really like the look of things, mm-hmm. especially when they're good product in a good looking package. And Uber Lube looks, it looks like I'm using um, a, a fancy lotion yeah, from like a cosmetic. Uh, yeah, I just shopped at Saks. If Fifth you've never Avenue. seen a photo, just go to our homepage on our website, shamelesssex.com. You'll see a photo, and then if you click on that link, then you can actually buy a bottle to and try. It's a for glass yourself. bottle too. It's glass. Yeah, it's it's beautiful glass bottle. So the ingredients inside is just really clean. It's just silicone and vitamin E. It's really body friendly. A lot of doctors are on board recommending it. Yeah, I actually want it all over my body. I want it everywhere, and I never ever once have I felt like I need to take a shower now that I've used it. Instead, I'm like. No. rubbing it in as much it's as silky. possible. It's mm-hmm. silky. You put in your hair today. We were at a I meeting did, and yeah. she's like, do you want Uber Lube for your hair? And I'm like, dude, my hair be flat right now. <laughs> so no, but I'm like, but if it gets frizzy, let me know. It actually does. And like I have, uh, my partner has a bunch of tattoos, so I'll put it on his tattooed oh, yeah. back. Yeah, multi-purpose. Yeah, after, you know, the anal. <laughs> Post anal, you're like, Post anal. You scoot, I'm like, you know what? You scoot on his back. <laughs> I, try, I try not to scoot anymore. <laughs> Oh God! Uh, anyway, I don't so know if really people know what we're talking about. It's probably best dogs that you don't. Scooting. Damn it! Why'd you have to out me? <laughs> Spoiler alert! Wait, you don't scoot. I'm talking about dogs scooting. Sometimes you get itchy bun. <laughs> <laughs> I bet Uber Lube's good for that. That's not what they say. But uh, <laughs> anyways, so hopefully we didn't uh, turn you off from Uber yeah, talking about scooting. Like, and I'm looking for another podcast. No, <laughs> I mean I will say I've tried many, many lubes as someone who uh, has owned a sex shop and has tried many lubes. And in the sex shop, we had to try every single lube there being uh, an employee What's there. Uberlube site though? Is it Uberlube? Uber the best. Is it uberlube.com? Uh, yes. So go to uberlube.com and if you use coupon code SHAMELESSSEX in all caps, you get 10% off as well as free shipping. Mm. Uh, that's at uberlube.com. And Do you if know if that's global? We have, I, don't, I don't even know. Or is that a USA? Free shipping probably means USA. USA? Yeah. But I'm sure you, you can order yeah. it global. You can order it globally for sure. Well, it, I mean, it is global. There's there's sex shops all over the world that has Uberlube. But and there's listeners all over the world that love shameless sex. Ooh, correlation? Ooh. I think so. <laughs> um, and then also, if you are um, buying a whole bunch of other sex toys or another sex toy and you also want Uber Lube, um, you can also go to purepleasureshop.com with coupon code SHAMELESSSEX in all caps. You also get 15% off there. Um, you don't get the free shipping that you get with Uber Lube, but you, then you can also either throw in a bottle of Uber Lube there and a sex toy. So if you just want the Uber Lube, go to uberlube.com. Uber Lube is made in the USA too, so it ships from yes. Chicago. Chicago. Chicago, where April. near near Wisconsin. April's from Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Yeah, I like when, it. When she has three glasses of wine, you can hear little no. Wisconsin. Okay, Except five. I'm talking to my mom. The tequila, maybe? The when I'm talking to my mom, I'm like, hey, mom, <laughs> what you doing today? All right, you guys ready for a sex question? <laughs> I am. I saw this one come in, and I'm happy that we're, we are approaching it because it is interesting. I think it fits also with a little bit of um, our podcast Perfect. today. All right, everyone. So, sex question. I am a 34-year-old male, and I have been with my fiancé for two years now, and I love her to death and wouldn't want anyone else. There is just one issue. I never want sex. I can go months without sex, and it doesn't bother me at all. It is getting so bad that she is threatening to call off the engagement and leave me because I can't meet her needs, and the thing is I don't want to lose her, and she expresses how she feels, but I still don't change. I just don't want sex. This has been an issue in all of my relationships. I have gotten my testosterone checked and it is normal, so I don't know what is wrong with me. I need help or I may lose the love of my life. Wow. Mm. Yeah, th- I, I'm, I really wanted to share this one because we usually hear this the reverse. You usually hear... Right. I mean, 
a lot of times it's the other the female body yeah. person who's like I don't have a high sex drive my partner wants sex all the time and there's what do we do so I think it's helpful to highlight someone who's having this experience um, they and this, they've had it for a long time. It's been in most of the relationships and they've had the testosterone check, so it's not hormonal. Well, I, my question for this person, and I know you'll have a more kind of therapy-oriented response, which is uh, always good to have, but from my immediate, my immediate reaction to this is, okay, uh, how do you feel about yourself? How are you feeling good about yourself? Are you uh, tapping into kind of what turns you on without leave your partner out of it? Um, do you masturbate? If not, how do you find pleasure? And if it's something that you've maybe, maybe this is a, a person that's asexual. Um, I don't know because all we get is the actual words that they're writing to us. We don't know any more of their story, but that would be my question. And so if it's something like, that, that they're answering like definitely not asexual. I definitely fantasize about X, Y, and Z. Um, I just, maybe I don't want to objectify my fiance or I, um, maybe, uh, I need the right environment to feel turned on or I don't feel good about my body. I hate myself right now because I, you know, I haven't worked out and well, who knows? Like, this is what I'm saying. I think there are a lot of key elements involved to, uh, being turned on to a kind of getting that spark to shift. And I know when I'm stressed out, which maybe this human is stressed out, or I um, have some, some things happening in my life that I feel like aren't in my control. I, it, it triggers me. It, it puts on my brake, not my accelerator. I don't get more sexual. I put my brakes get put on and I, I kind of shut down and I'll try to actually masturbate my way out of it. So um, to be like, okay, I st it's still on. Like, I'll just kind of focus on that. But that would be my question for this listener is um, what other things are going on? Yeah. So I think you that's helpful that you said that because you actually point out a number of things I would have missed. So one thing is, are they even masturbating? You know, are they feeling desire or arousal at all? Right. Or is this just that they don't want to have sex? And I... And I it's clear that they love their partner. So it's not like in no way that I, I don't think there's an issue of I'm not attracted to you. It's not that just that I don't want to have sex with my partner It's that they just don't want to have sex. Do they still feel arousal and want to masturbate on occasion? Or is that just completely turned off and turned down? Has it always been turned off and turned down? Uh, so it, because w it, what you point out April is, you know, if we are talking about asexuality, um, yeah, uh, asexual folks say they don't really feel sexual attraction to someone. Um, but they can still sometimes feel, you know, arousal and desire and want to masturbate. That doesn't mean that that goes away entirely. And sometimes for some of them, maybe maybe not, but everyone's different in terms of what, what works for them or what desire they have. So these are interesting things to point out. You know, is it just related to having sex with someone? Um, is their desire and arousal completely gone? It's been like this in all relationships, but has in all, have in all relationships, have you also just not had any arousal desire at all, even right. to touch your own body? Um, I would my uh, my suggestion or my thought would be that if it's been in all of your relationships, and it's you're not saying that shame comes up because they're not like oh shame comes up or I had a was had a religious upbringing or you know all these things it's just that like I just don't really want to have sex my first thought would be maybe asexuality is is an, is something to um to look into more and to to see if that uh, if you you identify case. with that right it's not something you can test for or anything but just you get to decide oh yeah that actually does explain my experience um or is it something that you did once feel a long time ago and some things have shifted in your life where that has faded, whether it's um, an internal story of I don't feel desire so or an arousal, so therefore you think that you don't feel desire and arousal because you've been in that story for so long? Mm. Is there a point when that was available and then that shifted? Um, because if that's the case, then I don't think asexuality would really apply. Asexual folks kind of describe that just like any other orientation. This has kind of always been there. Mm -hmm. um, versus, you know, someone who just kind of loses desire, arousal, libido. Um, usually it was there at some point and then it fades based on long-term relationship, trauma, shame, etc. So um, to look at it from those places. And then they're actually saying like, what, what the fuck do I do? 
Um, I think more information would be required yes. from this person. Like, yeah. I mean, as you know, if uh, if they are listening to this response, perhaps you can re- reach out to a sex educator, uh, to Amy specifically, who yes, um, sex well, could do sessions for yeah. you. A sex, yeah, a sex coach. Yeah, uh, oh, and maybe for you and your partner to go for together your as well, yes. too. If you feel like your your fiance is threatening to postpone the engagement or to call it off. Um, to go together. Well, it might be triggering for your fiance as they could be like, what, you don't desire me? Like, what am I doing? Yeah. And and I, I won't Which isn't, this. isn't on you, by the way. No, yeah. I have. I, I actually have a very good friend of mine who um, is in a marriage that um, it's, you know, their relationship before they were married was very sexless. Uh-huh. And she knew that going in and um, it progressed where they would go six or seven or eight months. Um, and a lot of that, and that was on um, her husband's part, mostly. He wouldn't initiate. He was very um, uh, just not sexual. He wasn't uh, ever turned on, and she took a lot of it onto herself. But um, they've been doing the work. They've been seeing um, an amazing, uh, I think it's a coach, a, some kind of sex and relationship coach. Uh, and it's helped. But it's also he had to tap into some childhood trauma yeah. that was really was affecting his there. sex drive. Yeah, so there's some the, uh, that's often the case, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just which is why I think it's important what you said, like yeah. have your partner go with you. Yeah, uh, and go so yeah, go in there and check it out. There could be stuff that he was this person was maybe blocking that. Yeah, you didn't no even idea. know. Yeah, yeah, you have no idea that it was there. So it's it's definitely worthy of looking into. And then what do you do? Like you, like April said, go get the education, go get the support. Don't try to do this all on your own. And I hope that we're helping a little bit, but really going and getting that support from. Like, like a, a coach or a therapist. You got to do the out. work. got to do the no work. No easy words. And what we find in relationship, whether we're talking about one partner having low libido or one partner being asexual, they often are in relationship and still find ways to be intimate with other people or mm. find people, you know, it, sometimes if you're already in the relationship, so that's not, not really an option to go and like screen your, your wife or your fiance because she's your fiance, but sometimes they would choose to enter a relationship with someone else that matched them in having low libido or being asexual. But in this case, um, there's ways to work with each other, right? There's ways for folks who have a low libido, who don't desire to sex, to step outside of themselves and still be intimate with their partner in a way that honors where they're at, but is still sex. You know, it might not be penetrative sex. It might not be... Well, this is, I think, a perfect example of... I know that this particular listener mm-hmm. uh, is male-bodied and the um, the fiancé is a vulva owner. You... The, this... Uh, questioner uh, could tap into OMGS and find all the ways mm-hmm. if they are uninterested yeah. with uh, they, they're like look this is my, my my deal is I'm asexual I still want you to feel pleasure yeah uh, you could really tap into OMGS. Yeah, you could the, just you could just some give education to them, right? Yeah, there's if that's because you obviously love your partner, you've gone into detail to tell us just twice in this question. You're like, I don't want to lose her. I want to get help. I need help. If if all of those things that we're saying before, or even if they're not, but OMGS. Like check it out. Go to omgs.com and then backslash 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 shameless, backslash backslash shameless. shameless. Yeah. and you can get five dollars off. But that is, I think, a, that would be probably where um, I would suggest if someone that I knew close to me had the same situation happening, I would be like, check out this yeah. website, get access to videos, and learn how to learn how to pleasure vulvas in lots of different ways that could be really exciting and and different and new and fresh that uh you know your partner will probably love i love that you just said that you're you're nailing this <laughs> all these, these oh, sorry i'm interrupting you too n- no you didn't no i'm i'm so i love that you just you did just now and you said sorry but <laughs> no i was really saying that like that's that is in itself brilliant like when you when you look at this question it's like okay maybe you don't want sex but you can still go outside of yourself and show up and pleasure someone and be in service. And of course, you need to get a yes to it. Doesn't mean that you just like get a no and you do that. But you can find your internal yes. And then there's things if you don't know what to do, or you do but you don't feel that confident. There's things like OMGS where you get these actual videos and modules where you can practice the techniques, and then your partner can watch them too. She can actually or you watch can them. surprise her with all your knowledge. All your for like watch seven, yes. and then that next seven days, be like or hey, you could share with her and say, hey, I got this 
listening, watch this. Tell me the three, watch all the videos. Tell me the three you want me to do. Yeah. And I will do those. For That's you. an experiential way to really, I think, activate and put the, 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 I don't know, the emotional slash physical connection back into your partnership Yeah, uh, is to understand that you want to do the pleasing and let her surrender to what you're learning. Yeah. Yeah. It's a gift. And it's it's a hard place when libidos and arousal, desire, et cetera, don't match in partnership. And it, it's almost always the case where people well, don't perfectly match. I also, I, I there's so many questions for this person, but uh, like they could be on pharmaceuticals or something that might yeah. be affecting their sex drive. They could be, your testosterone that, is okay, but like diet true. and exercise, like those types of things, they do affect your sex drive, yeah, 100%. So what, we can get off of the question now because I think we did a pretty damn fine <laughs> job answering it. Yeah, but if you're the person that wrote this question, you're uh, more than welcome to email us and um, go into finer detail and we'll gladly respond to you via email to, um, to give you maybe a more in-depth response once we know more about what you are actually experiencing. Um, are you almost ready for the bio? We pour me a glass of wine I'm first. ready, you know... I will because we've been drinking. This isn't how my well, I have half of this glass left, but margins, margins, um, margins wine. We talk about it every show, not only because it's women owned and operated, mm-hmm. because they make a fabulous product. Mm-hmm. It's boutique, small batched wine, so it's not this mass produced wine like when you go to a lot of wine stores anywhere across the country, especially the USA. Uh, you know, you get a lot of mass produced wine. Uh, Megan Bell, who owns Margins Wine, she's the creator, super talented. She. She's been making um, different wines now for a few years, and they're underrepresented varietals, meaning so typically you see Chardonnay, Pinot Noir. She'll take kind of something that you haven't really heard of, um, some old world, some kind of California styles, and then she makes these beautiful wines that handpick the grapes, um, no excessive sulfites added, meaning naturally occurring sulfites always happen, but uh, there's no extra. So uh, check it out. Go to margins marginswine.com. Her next release, the time of this podcast comes out, it's um, almost the end of March, but her next release of wines is going to be in April. And if you're on her newsletter, there's no commitment to buy, but you get first, basically first chance to receive her, I think it's pretty much a limited edition selection of wine. There's a few different options. You can also check out the different wines that are um, going to be available. So And continue listening to our podcast because then we give you, once it's released, a coupon code to get discounts on oh, yeah, the we delicious do. wine. Which she never offers. She only gives it to us. And she constantly, she's totally sold out of wine right now, but she constantly sells out. So um, she basically does two releases a year and... It's coming up, so get it while it's hot. Coming 2019. Up. This is 2019, by the way. Yeah. Someone's if listening. 2015. I could be 45 right now when someone's listening. Awesome. Yeah, I'm it's happy about that. Still looking hot. I'm probably really into the gangbangs well, right podcast, now. And yeah. I'm here for the gangbangs. You'll know why she said that, because in the <laughs> podcast that I'll read the bio for right now, uh, he says that when you're in, a lot of studies show that when people are in their 40s and 50s, or just 40s. He said it starts kind of when you're in their 40s, and then it, it sort of dissipates after the 50s, they but more it group does. sex fantasies, mm-hmm. yeah. We're doing a lot of spoiler alerts, though. We need to let people no, listen. No, this is what lures them in, Ooh. so they haven't tuned us out. Okay. All right, okay. All right everyone. Are you ready for the bio? So Dr. Justin Miller received his PhD in social psychology from Purdue University. He is a research fellow at the Kinsey Institute and author of the book, Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Help You Improve Your Sex Life. Dr. Leigh Miller is an award-winning educator, having been honored three times with the Certificate of Teaching Excellence from Harvard University, where he taught for several years. He is also a prolific researcher and scholar who has published more than 40 pieces of academic writing to date, including a textbook entitled The Psychology of Human Sexuality that is used in college classrooms and around the world. Dr. Leigh Miller has run the popular blog Sex and Psychology since 2011, and he has published articles in numerous media outlets, including Playboy, USA Today, Vice, Politico, and New York Magazine. To learn more, visit sexandpsychology.com. Are you ready to learn? I have one word for you, Amy. Yes. (laughs) It's not a word. Damn it. All right, everyone, it is episode time. And as always, we're always excited about podcasts. Uh, This one, 
I'm extremely excited about uh, as someone who uh, used to shame themselves for their fan the fantasies. I, I mean, I guess I did. I've had partners that shame me for for my fantasies and didn't understand them. Um, and so I love I love sharing this information with people. But I love love when we have some other fellow nerdy researchers that are out there really uh, doing the work to understand on a scientific level of you know the science behind sexual desire and uh, fantasy. So we're really excited to have you here, Dr. Justin Lay Miller. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Yay, we're happy to have you. And I'll have you uh, maybe dissect my fantasies in a little bit. But before we do that, because this isn't all about me, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to, um, how you came about to write this book, the book, uh, Tell Me What You Want, The Science of Sexual Desire and How It Can Help You Improve Your Sex Life? Sure. I am currently a research fellow at the Kinsey Institute. Uh, And for the last 10 years, I've been a sex educator at colleges and universities around the country. And um, sexual fantasies are a topic that have kind of always been of interest to me. I've had to teach about it as part of the courses I do. But I kind of found that I had a lot of questions about fantasies that weren't addressed in the research. So I decided to conduct my own work to, to better understand and answer some of those questions that had just never been answered before so that we can shed some light on uh, and, and better understand a topic that I think a lot of us just don't know enough about and many people feel a lot of shame and guilt and anxiety about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that... Uh... That shame, I tell you, that shame that that people feel. That's why I mean, that's why we have a whole podcast. <laughs> so you did. Can you tell us about the research process? Then I, I remember it's something like four thousand people or something. Yep. So I recruited four thousand one hundred seventy-five people. Uh, they took a survey that consisted of three hundred sixty-nine questions. Uh, the sixty-nine was not intentional, but um, <laughs> uh, they answered questions about their favorite sex fantasy of all time and hundreds of people, places, and things they might have ever fantasized about. And I looked at how that was related to their demographic backgrounds, their personalities, their sexual histories, and I just kind of wanted to get a better sense of what are people fantasizing about and what do our fantasies say about us? And it took almost two years to collect all of that data. And then I spent another year or two writing the book. Uh, So it was a a, a big investment of time. So really the question is though, after all of this research, what did you discover in just two words? I'm just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) So easy. But I mean, that's got to be so interesting to look at that data and to kind of dissect even culturally or where you're located like or how you grew up or I mean I don't know all the questions you asked but yeah what did you discover can you tell us a little bit more about that I discovered a lot of things and I'm still discovering more and thinking about new ways to go about presenting the data Uh, so for example one of the things I'm working on right now is a a map of the United States where I can put the the single most common fantasy in each state uh, on oh, that map. Hey, that um, is so cool. It, it's it's going to be a thing. I just that's never I, been done before. <laughs> done would, with, that's so cool. They've done it with porn searches, but but not with with people's sex fantasies. So um, I'm looking forward to that. But uh, some of the main things I found were you know, I looked at what are the most common sexual fantasies people report having. And I found that there were seven main themes that seemed to characterize people's fantasies. Those were multi-partner sex, uh, so having group encounters or threesomes, uh, BDSM ranging from mild to wild, uh, you know, from spankings to electric shocks and more. Uh, then there was the the sort of novelty, adventure, and variety category where it was just you're stepping out and doing something that's new and different, like trying a new position or having sex in a new setting. Uh, then there were the taboo fantasies where people are violating some social or cultural norm and getting off on that. Uh, then there were the emotional fulfillment fantasies where people are intimately connecting with a partner or feeling desired or wanted. And uh, then there were the non-monogamy fantasies where people are trying swinging or polyamory or open relationships. And then lastly, there were the, what I call gender bending and uh, homoerotic fantasies where people are sort of pushing the boundaries of their gender role or expression or of their sexual orientation. So those were really the, the seven major things that people seem to be fantasizing about. 
Mm. And then there was just a lot of um, little, little, I guess I, it, I'm relating this in my brain to, uh, is it Jack Morin's work around the core erotic theme, uh, the erotic mind. And so there was, you know, these, these general themes, which is kind of what you're talking about. And then beneath, underneath them, there's the movies, which are, there's millions of them, you know, little, the little fantasies that people can have. It's kind of a similar concept, but you were specifically talking about fantasy. Absolutely. Yeah. And there, there's definitely some linkages to the, the erotic mind uh, by Jack Warren. And when I give talks and workshops uh, around my fantasy stuff, uh, I do talk about uh, his work and, and the relationships there. But I go much deeper in terms of looking at, so how are these fantasies all connected to our personalities and our sexual backgrounds and, and trying to take this really comprehensive look at where our fantasies come from, what they say about us, and then also how do we talk to our partners about them? And what happens when people go the extra mile and try to make their fantasy a reality? Does that usually work out? And are there certain things you can do to increase the odds of a better experience? You just asked all the questions we're going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with the first one. Why do people have, like what in your research, why are people having the fantasies that they're having? Well, there's a lot of different factors that are involved there. Um, so on the one hand, you know, I do talk about some of the evolutionary explanations behind some of our fantasies. Uh, and, and so in, in the case of evolutionary theory, um, the fact that men fantasize about group sex and gangbangs more than women um, could be tied to some evolutionary factors. Uh, so, so there's some research showing that when men are exposed to these cues of what, what's called sperm competition, where you have multiple men competing over the same woman, uh, that that leads to this heightened state of arousal. And it was thought to be evolutionarily adaptive because they would release more sperm and uh, that would increase their odds of successful reproduction. So you might have evolutionary factors that play a role, but you also have a lot of individual psychological factors. So your personality says a lot about your fantasies. If you're someone who is very extroverted in real life, you tend to be very extroverted in your sex fantasies and you're meeting a lot of new people and you're more likely to have group sex. Uh, if you're somebody who is highly agreeable and you have a lot of care and concern about other people's feelings and welfare, well, in your fantasies, you tend to be much more focused on their pleasure and, and whether they're enjoying the experience. Um, our fantasies are also a product of our sexual history and sexual experiences. So if your early sexual experiences were unusual in some way, you tend to have more unusual sexual fantasies, right? Uh, so, so all of these factors come together to, to give us these, these sort of unique and highly individualized fantasies that we have. So I'm going to make it personal about myself <laughs> and talk specifically about, um, I think this will go under maybe the BDSM category, but rape, rape and forced sex fantasies, which I know are, are really, really common. Um, on the evolutionary side, I did hear, I think it was Chris Ryan who wrote Sex at Dawn was quoting some other, someone else, something else, some other research, and it was saying that there's this evolutionary theory that, um, I think there was a study of uh, female-bodied folks watching... Uh, oh my God, I'm going to say this incorrectly, but do you know what I'm talking about at all? They were watching some imagery that showed um, forced that sexual encounter. Emily Nagowski, I think. She was talking about it on her... I, was it Chris? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, and, and when they were watching imagery of something, of a forced sexual encounter, and oh my God, I'm going to say this wrong, but essentially they, they, did, they did not say they were turned on, but their vaginal fluids, which they have produced, you know what, your head is nodding, so yeah. yes, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. That, that there might be some, and so then there was like the theory is that it's a survival thing, you know, that they might someone might force something on them so their body, ought, even though they're not turned on, produces the fluid. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't explain the fantasy That's part. Like the arousal concordance, yes. non-concordance. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's like oh, when it, that is, it, she did touch yes. on that in her book because I just finished it. So I was like, no, I was, I remember the area where they're ta talking about that because no one would admit yeah. that they were actually turned on by what they saw, but whatever, um, you know, they had uh, them linked up to. Yeah. The, I don't know what the thing is called. I'm not a doctor. I don't know. Oh, gee, yeah. that is it. <laughs> but, uh, but it would like trigger it and their heart rate would go up. And I don't know what they, if they checked out their juices, but. But this still, this, so yeah, yeah, that's arousal non concordance. That's, yeah, good, good, good correction there. And, but th this doesn't speak to fantasy. So mm -hmm. why? And so I can speak for myself. I was nine or 10. I saw Melrose Place, if anyone knows what show that was. I just dated myself. I'm 34. And they had a rape scene in it. And I was. So super turned on. 
And, and, and so, and I know that there's, like you're saying, there's so many things that it can come from, you know, I don't have uh, any sort of forced sexual trauma or anything in, in my past. At that point, I had kind of heard about sex and then never saw porn, just didn't really, but, it, but that whole thing was just like the idea of this forced sex that I really in real life don't want. So I, and I know a lot about this already, but I want your expert opinion. <laughs> well, just to back up one second, I have actually seen every episode of Melrose Place, so <laughs> yeah. I, I, I share your 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 love of it. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, no when when it comes to the the four sex fantasies, I think it's worth noting first that women in general have more BDSM fantasies. And, and I think that four sex fantasies are just one variant of that. So there's something that, that predisposes women to, to be more interested in BDSM. So in terms of why women might have more BDSM fantasies and more forced sex fantasies, um, one of the factors that might explain a role there is that women in general are more likely to fantasize about being the object of desire than men. And I think when you're thinking about BDSM and forced sex, it's hard to think of something that turns you into an object more than being dominated or tied up or um, uh, just being treated in those ways. And so it might stem from the fact that women are just more likely to have those object of desire fantasies. Um, Women also... uh, may fantasize more about BDSM and for sex uh, because maybe to some extent they're searching for an escape from self-awareness. And we know that BDSM fantasies do this. They allow you to to sort of get out of your head and um, and, um, just, just sort of let go and enjoy uh, the, the sex and, the, and, and, and sort of be in the moment. And we know that women are given all of these cultural messages about how they shouldn't be sexual and so forth. And so maybe an activity where they can escape that self-awareness and escape those social and cultural pressures, maybe that's more appealing to women. Mm-hmm. So, I, so I think on, on that, now is a good moment to kind of bring in the, the difference between well, there's, you're speaking a couple of things. One, there's that our fantasy life whether you want it to happen or not, and our sex life can almost balance out our everyday life, right? If I'm like, yep. that's why you hear a lot of like the busy CEO who's running everything who likes to be spanked, you know, in, 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 you know, in a submissive role in the bedroom. Um, so there's that piece that you're speaking to, but also the difference between fantasy being fantasy and some of them we might want to actually become reality but just so what what's the, what about that you know why do we have some of these things that we want to happen and not want to happen but they're both arousing to us mm-hmm. so I, I think it's important to step back and say that there's a difference between a sexual fantasy and a sexual desire a fantasy is a mental picture or a thought that is sexually arousing to you and it doesn't necessarily have to be something that you want to do on the other hand, a desire is something that you do truly want to do. And your fantasies could be desires, but they don't have to be. What I find is that what people describe as their favorite fantasy of all time does tend to be a desire. It's something that they want to act out and make a part of their, their sexual reality. But people also have dozens, sometimes hundreds of, of other fantasies, and they don't necessarily want to act on all of those. So, um, you know, some fantasies are desires and some aren't. Um, so with sexual fantasy, sometimes we just use it as a tool to, to turn us on. Um, and we just go to that because even though we know there's no possibility of it happening or we don't actually want it to happen, it's just the idea of it turns us on for some reasons, whether it's a result of, um, you know, cultural conditioning factors or, uh, or or it's just the spontaneous thought that pops into your head that turns you on. Um, We don't necessarily know how to explain it, but sometimes uh, the thought just turns you on, even though you have no desire to actually do that. I had this, and not to turn it about me again, but I had this (laughs) fantasy for years and years, and I I never had had a threesome with um, uh, like a male-bodied and a female-bodied individual, and that was always the thing that I wanted to do. And then it happened several times, and I would watch porn. That was like my thing, like privately watch the porn. And uh, at the time I was married, and my ex-husband was always like really wanting to do a threesome, and finally it happened. It happened a few times, and then that fantasy kind of went away. Like I, I don't... I, I don't 
access that kind of porn anymore. I'm on a porn break anyway, doctor. Uh, but I, <laughs> but uh, I think that now I'm, I was kind of mentioning when we were uh, pre-recording that like, this taxi cab thing, which I have no desire, but I've been wa- I was watching this taxi cab porn when I was wa- watching porn, and I'd have no desire for that to happen. But it was like the pure taboo nature of it. So I was trying to figure out where I fit in when you went through um, the normalcies of folks and what they were what they were into. But I'm a very extroverted person, and I feel like in the bedroom I'm more introverted, and that's why I think like it's wild and crazy for me to be like, oh, sex with a stranger. So I don't know. I'm trying to... I'm dissecting myself right now. And I don't necessarily have a question. I just wanted to process that with you since you're here. No. Well, I think it shows how dynamic it is. You know, there isn't yeah. one way to be just because you're extroverted in one place means it doesn't mean you're going to... You know, it's, it's like there's so many... There's so much to it. And then it can change maybe if you uh-huh. do tap into those things that you are really seeking out and desiring because maybe it was a fantasy for me. But once it became reality, I realized, okay, I did desire that. It happened. Now I want to move forward and... and, and into some other things, into a taxi cab, <laughs> <laughs> right? And and I think that there's there's something that explains that that's called the Coolidge effect, which is basically this idea that we tend to grow bored with sexual routines, and that we need to keep interjecting novelty in our sex lives to keep it fresh and exciting and arousing. So we see in studies where if somebody watches the same porn clip every day for a week, uh, they tend to become less aroused to it over time, regardless of the gender of uh, the viewer. So you need to keep introducing novelty. And so when it comes to fantasies, if you act out your fantasy, you might have a great experience, but maybe you want to do it a few times, but then you know it starts to become part of the routine. And so you need to, to mix it up with a taxi cab or whatever, right? It's, it's finding a new way of, of just keeping that novelty uh, alive. So, so your experience definitely makes sense in light of the research. Yeah, I'm not going to try to put the taxi cab thing to make that happen. I'm just you know, it's, well, it's that- specifically British taxis too. You know, the the double doored ones. Like I don't know what they're called, but the like the black cars that you see. Anyway, um, so well, well, if you're never going to act on it, now you're going to be fixated. You know, yeah. you're, you're going to be stuck on taxi cabs. But that's forever. great spank bank material, right? There you go. Just keep it in the arsenal. Yeah. Well, I've also been obsessed with this like step dad daughter thing lately where they're of age of course but like i've been like oh because it's so naughty like and i always and i have a plethora of father issues you know working through my whole life and and um i i was actually questioning my whole spank bank material the other day when i was thinking about that during pleasuring myself yeah and i, I think so let's i guess we can go into the this sh- we'll go in the partner probably talk about part with our partners but the, sh- the shame piece you know there's so many people feel shame for these things like oh i'm essentially having incest fantasies it's super shameful like for me i'm like oh my god i'm shaming myself but i'm telling everyone now that's listening so how do you how do you explain for to folks i know you're more on the research side but you were you're in the psychology realm too how do you explain to folks to work with that shame Mm-hmm. I, I think a good starting point is to begin by recognizing that you're not the only one who has those fantasies and your fantasies probably aren't weird or abnormal. So when it comes to something like, say, incest fantasies, a lot of people feel uncomfortable with them, but they're actually a lot more common than you think. So in my own research, I found that one in five participants reported having had an incest fantasy before. And I defined incest specifically as sex with a blood relative. So by that definition, the stepfather, stepdaughter scenario that you described wouldn't have actually even been included in that. That's only because in the porn, they don't never say father. They just say stepfather. But it could be, you know, I use my imagination. Mm. But but if a little less shameful. Yeah. (laughs) But if you if you expanded the definition of incest to include that, um, you'd probably see that even more people have had an incest fantasy fantasy than than one in five. So I I think for the most part, people's fantasies are much more common than they think. And what I see in my data is that the rarer people think their fantasies are, the more shame and guilt, anxiety they have about them, even if their fantasy actually is a common one. So I think we need to start with sex education and just giving people a better idea of 
what normal is when it comes to sex and uh, re- redefining what normal is and expanding it and saying that it's so much more than what you think it is. Okay. But my question is, if we got rid of the shame and normalize mm-hmm. it, would people be having as hot of fantasies anymore? <laughs> you know, if we were like, hey, it's all good. You know, that incest fantasy that you have is like, I mean, that's what we're essentially doing here. But is, is it part of that that makes it extra hot? The, the taboo element of it makes it hot. I think the taboo part and the shame part may be different things, mm-hmm. right? Um, so you can be turned on by a lot of taboo things, but not feel any guilt about it at all, right? <laughs> um, so, so I think if we removed the shame and guilt, um, we wouldn't necessarily remove that, that hotness factor from it. Because what makes it hot is just knowing that you're not supposed to do it. Mm-hmm. That, like this is something that because I am, you know, this, uh, this uh, very, I feel a like communicative person, but when it comes to communicating my fantasies, it's very difficult for me, apparently not to you, a complete stranger, <laughs> but to my partner. Uh, so I'm sure that there's other listeners out there that can relate to that specifically. Mm-hmm. And I guess my question kind of is, is like, is this something, how do, how do we discuss the, the, these fantasies, these sexual fantasies with our partners? Is that something we should, we should go down and discuss? I, of course, I try to tap in, but I'm sure our listeners would love your advice as well. Yeah, this is one of these things where you can gain a lot potentially by sharing your fantasies with a partner. And most of my participants, and I think your listeners will be very reassured by this, most people report having really positive experiences sharing their fantasies with a partner and also acting on them too. Um, so, so that's good news. Uh, now, when it comes to actually like passing that first hurdle of, of, of sharing your fantasies with your partner, you need to start first by making sure you feel good about yourself and then choosing the right time and place to, to have a discussion about sexual fantasy. So, you know, not something where you're out at dinner, at, you know, in public, uh, you know, you want to do this in a, in a quiet, private place. Um, ideally, maybe when you're both already sexually aroused, because when people are sexually aroused, their disgust response lessens. So your partner might be a little bit more receptive to you sharing some of your fantasies. If maybe you do this after you watch a, a steamy movie together or something along those lines. And then when you start sharing your fantasies, it's it's starting low and going slow, right? Don't jump into the kinkiest thing you can possibly think of. Um, you know, start with the more vanilla fantasies and share those and, and validate your partner as you're sharing your fantasies with them. Tell them how they play an important and central role in your fantasy and how this isn't about you wanting to get rid of them or replace them or anything. And that, you know, the sex you have is great. You just want to add something new to it, right? So I think all of these things are ways that you can start those conversations and then eventually move it down the path of sharing the more adventurous and fantasies and maybe even acting on some of them too. I just sent my partner a message to rent a taxi cab this week. I'm going to get that home as you're saying that. And, but she didn't, and no other explanation, just rent a taxi cab. We'll talk later. We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, can you take on a British accent? Yes. Can you please? <laughs> please. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, wait, I had a question related to that, but you <laughs> completely lost it. That's fine. Uh, Fantasy is talking about, oh, yes, I, it came back to me. Um, so what if you, what if, I know, I know, okay, I know in most cases, people that say, hey, partner, here's my fantasy. And they're like, oh, okay. And it goes well. What if though they say, hey, here's my fantasy. And your partner says, that's not normal. I mean, mm-hmm. my answer would be go listen to Shameless Sex Podcast so we can help to normal, to tell your partner to come listen to us so we can help normalize it. But do you have any other tips for that partnership? Yeah, so... It does happen sometimes that people will kink shame their partners when they they start sharing their fantasies. And again, that's why it's important when you start getting into this area of you don't want to lead with something that you think could potentially turn your partner off, right? You need to build up that trust and intimacy and have solid sexual communication skills. Because a lot of people, I think, just sort of jump into, okay, here's my favorite fantasy. How do we make this happen? And I actually get emails from a lot of people. They're like, I'm really into cuckolding. How do I convince my wife to do this? And it's like, okay, you're, you're, you're thinking about this wrong. Like, the, the way you should start is let's establish good sexual communication, have trust and intimacy so that when it comes time for you to share your, your favorite fantasies, your deepest desires, that you're in that place of non-judgment and, and you can have that open exchange. That's not going to guarantee that it's going to happen, but it'll increase the odds of a positive experience. Now, if you try all that and you still find that your partner shames you, um, 
you know, that signifies you might have bigger relationship problems you need to work on and you need to figure out whether you're, you're sexually compatible or not for the long run. Mm-hmm. I get a lot of, of yeah. inquiries regarding like, how can I get my partner to be, you know, have a threesome or I've shared that and they get uh, turned off by it. So I think that's really good advice. And that's something that we do, it, I think, touch on often is like, if you are, if your fantasies or you're getting shamed or your partner's not showing up for you in certain ways, especially if you're being vulnerable and open about what you're desiring, um, that it could be, yeah, indication of a, of a deeper rooted issue yeah. to, to reflect on. Yeah. And, and and when it comes to the group sex part, you know, yeah, a lot of people fantasize about this. They want to do it. Group sex was actually one of the biggest, most popular fantasies people had in my work. Um, but they were also the fantasy that was least likely to turn out well when people acted on it, right? So it's like, you, you want to take baby steps to threesomes and orgies <laughs> and you, you don't want to just, yeah, baby steps to everything. But, uh, you know, I think there's this when you start adding multiple people into the mix, there's all this uncertainty and it's like, who does what with whom and when and mm-hmm. what are the rules? And you need to make sure that you've got the communication and that you've started to think through, okay, what's actually going to happen in that scenario rather than just jumping into it? Or rather what I saw in a porn video where the orgy just went really smooth. Everything was great. Everyone had orgasms. No one was sad. No one felt left out. It was perfect. That's because they were paid to do that, right? Yeah. You gotta know. Can you, and, um, yeah. and, and they probably had a script to follow, so they knew what the hell they were doing. You That's know? true, yeah. <laughs> Wearing butt plugs to prep for their anal scenes. <laughs> All the stuff that we don't know, that we don't see happens in yeah. porn. That's mm-hmm. why you're here listening to us. We're here to help you. Um, okay, before we go to the next question, can you just, our, our listeners are like, what's cuckolding now? They're probably like, very, oh, yeah. can you, oh, ex- yeah. can you just do like a clip notes version of what that is? Just like, even if it's one yeah. time. The the short version is that cuckolding is when people want to watch their partner have sex with someone else. Most commonly, it's um, you know men, regardless of orientation, are fantasizing about watching their partners have sex oh, with someone else. Okay, okay. Um, it, it is possible some women do have these fantasies, but um, uh, they're they're a lot less common among women, especially heterosexually identified women. Okay. Hmm. Oh, we need a whole episode on that. For sure. <laughs> yeah, and there's actually a different name for it when it's when it's a woman watching a, a male partner. It's it's sometimes called cuck queening. Uh, so <laughs> cuck holding and cuck queening, you're you're expanding your sexual vocabulary. Where are those words? Or where did those originate from? I have no idea. Uh, I don't either. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so okay. I guess we talked about a little bit about acting on fantasy, and um, I mean the takeaway is to really. Be vulnerable, open yourself up, share, but not when you're in the bedroom, obviously, right? That's like not the right time. We've talked about that before. Do it outside, maybe, maybe at dinner. Maybe be like, hey, <laughs> maybe dinner at home. Maybe dinner, dinner at, home. at home. Yes. Um, so obviously, we want folks to check out your book because that's available to them. Do you th- it, the, the new book that just came out, um, the Tell Me What You Want. This one is more relevant to fantasy. And then the the, the book that is offered and it's like the most commonly re- read book or offered book at uh, human sexuality courses, right? Um, is that another book that folks should pick up and try to access? Or is that more of a clinical education sort of realm? Um, yeah, so, so that book, I, I wouldn't say it's the most widely used reference. We're resource, saying it now. But, <laughs> sorry, you know. sorry, I was building it up. <laughs> But hey, I'll, I'll take the compliment. Um, but it's, it's it's called the Psychology of Human Sexuality, and it's a book I wrote that's used in college classrooms around the world. And it's written in a way that anyone could read it. It's it's kind of written in the style of the blog that I do, and. I wrote it that way so that people would actually enjoy reading it and maybe even want to keep it as a reference guide. So if you're somebody who wants to learn about sex more broadly um, and better understand everything from anatomy and physiology to, uh, you know, the nuances and complexities of gender identity and sexual orientation, um, or or also different approaches to sex therapy, like that's a great reference and resource guide as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good to know. So to buy your book, where do people go? So I run a website called Sex and Psychology, which you can get to at sexandpsychology.com. And um, the links for my book are, are all on there in the sidebar. And you didn't you can say also... www either. Thank you for not <laughs> saying www. Who does that anymore? Anyway, A lot of people. 
Um, but, but also on my website, I blog about the latest sex research three times a week that I, I, I try to present it in a way that people will just they'll learn something and, and hopefully be entertained at the same time. And then your Audible book comes out Did because you, you, you said you just finished recording that. When is that going to be out um, for folks to pick up if they ch- want you to read the book to pick them? Pick up in their ears. Yes. <laughs> it, it is out now. And oh. I, spent, uh, I spent 17 hours in the studio recording it, but the finished product is only seven to eight hours. And you can listen to me read people's sex fantasies and explain the psychology behind them. Do you actually read fantasies? Like it's, it's like almost, is it like a part erotica at times? It, it is, and I've I've had I've had some people tell me after they listened to it um, that they they blushed or got hard or were aroused for big chunks of it. So I'm sure sometimes I, I watch PG got, yeah. 13 stuff. I'm like, that's hot. They're making out. I think he just like <laughs> just sold like twenty thousand more copies. Just <laughs> for real. For, no, for real. Um, if people want to work with you, can they do that? Can they do? Do you offer anything outside of just um, uh, being an, uh, an amazing author? <laughs> so I'm uh, primarily a, a researcher. And so, so sometimes I will post studies that you can participate in on my website. There's a, a sex studies tab. And so you can check that out if you want to participate. But I'm also offering different lectures and workshops. I travel around the country and do this. Um, so for example, you can also find this on my website. In May, I have talks and workshops in Los Angeles, Chicago, New York City, Seattle. So um, come out and see me if you you want to get the in person masterclass in in sex. I bet that's quite illuminating. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Doctor Lemile. I said that in French earlier. I was like, "Is it Lemile?" And you're like, uh, "I don't know, <laughs> not really." <laughs> Uh, but it sounds nice. It looks nice. Uh, but thank you for sharing a little bit of your wisdom on fantasy. This was really, this is cool for me. I, I loved it. I'm, I'm going to process this, listen to this episode after we're done recording and just process it and um, perhaps share some of my fantasies now with my partner. Amy, are you going to? He already knows them, but I'll share again. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> hey, you know, and, and you'll probably develop more fantasies as, as time goes on. They change. Uh, they totally do change. I've been stuck on, on this one scene for like five years in my head. It's like this little, you know, four second blip in my spank bank that just is pretty consistent. Um, but I think uh, I'm open to the change. I know that they change and I think reminders are helpful because I like ex- I like actually experiencing real life. So, yeah. and, and that was actually one of the most interesting things I talk about in the book is how our sex fantasies change as we age. Mm-hmm. So specifically as people approach age 40 and through their mid fifties, they become more interested in group sex and ah. just doing new and different and exciting things. And then it starts to decrease, you know, toward the, the later fifties. But so there's this whole sort of trajectory of sex fantasies that we have, which I think is pretty cool and has never been shown before. So you're saying there's something for me to look forward to in my forties. <laughs> Absolutely. Group sex, here I come. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, thank you again. We can't wait to like, just, I can't wait to listen to this episode and um, yeah, y'all check out sex and psychology.com and, um, and definitely get the book. Tell me what you want, the science of sexual desire and how it can help you improve your sex life. All right, y'all. Thank you for tuning in every Tuesday. We'll see you next Tuesday. Ciao for now. Don't forget to head on over to our website at shamelesssex.com for more. And for 15% off of some of our favorite sex toys, use coupon code SHAMELESSPP in all caps at purepleasureshop.com.